coronary heart disease is divided into chronic ischemic heart disease and acute coronary syndromes. Chronic ischemic heart disease includes our stable and our Prince Metal's angina, the vasospastic types of angina. Myocardial cells become ischemic when oxygen supply is inadequate to meet metabolic demands. Myocardial ischemia results from deficient blood flow, which can be caused by a partial obstruction, an arterial spasm, or a blood uh, or thrombus, a blood clot or thrombus. Obstruction of a coronary artery deprives the cells in the region of the heart normally supplied by that vessel of oxygen and nutrients needed for metabolic processes. Cellular processes are compromised as ATP stores are depleted. Reduced oxygen causes cells to switch from an aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. Ab anaerobic metabolism causes lactic acid to build up in the cells. It also affects cell membrane permeability, releasing substances such as histamine, kinins, and specific enzymes that stimulate nerve fibers in the cardiac muscle and send pain impulses to the central nervous system. More than 30 minutes of ischemia irreversibly damages the myocardial cells, leading to necrosis. We say that uh, myocardial infarctions evolve with time. At the center or core is where the early infarction uh, leads to a dense ischemia. And outside of that, we have another zone called the penumbra in which there is a moderate amount of ischemia. And this is um, um, as a result of a delayed infarction. In other words, the longer um, the infarction evolves, the larger this area and zone is going to grow in size. There are EKG changes during an episode of angina um, as a result of myocardial ischemia. So we're going to look at these changes here and we're going to notice that there is a T wave that is inverted. Typically the T wave is in an upward deflection and so here it is has a downward deflection and that would be considered inverted and that is one thing that we do see with ischemia in terms of EKG changes. In addition to that whenever there is ischemia we see an ST segment depression. Okay so looking at the ST segment You'll see that it falls below the isoelectric line. And because of that significant depression, um, that in addition to the T wave inversion, it indicates that there is ischemia occurring. Okay. So is the chest pain a result of ischemia or infarction. What is the difference here? Well, this slide clearly lays out that ischemia is a result of decreased blood flow that results in hypoxia or insufficient oxygen being delivered to the myocardial tissue. On the other side, we see the, the term infarction. Here, the blood flow is not simply decreased, but cut off completely. The tissues within, because of the lack of oxygen, um, it's, it's worse than ischemia. It is um, death, cellular death, what we, 
which we call necrosis. So that the area surrounding that typically depends on perfusion from that uh, coronary vessel is not receiving the oxygen that it needs. And th those cells then convert to a cellular respiration, which is anaerobic in nature, which eventually um, will lead to cellular death. Now, what is the difference between angina that results from ischemia and heart attack pain? They're both chest pain, but what is the difference between these two pains? Anginal pain is typically of short duration and classically relieved by rest. And that is not the case with heart attack pain. Heart attack pain is continuous in duration. Uh, it does not last for a short period of time and it is not relieved uh, by rest. We want to go on now and talk about an acute myocardial infarction. Typically, in the lay language, we say a heart attack. Okay, I want you to always think when you hear heart attack or acute MI, you're thinking occlusion of a coronary vessel or artery. Okay, always think immediately about what you do know about this condition. Uh, that will keep you oriented in being able to select the best answers on the exam, ones that are related to this specific type of pathophysiology. Okay, sometimes it's easy, as I said earlier, to get confused between heart attacks, heart failure, and electrical conduction problems or arrhythmias. They're all three very distinct. So it's important that you kind of keep those three things separated in your mind by going back to what you do know about them. So when you think of heart attack, I want you to envision the occlusion, the blockage of a coronary artery, okay? Acute myocardial infarction is death of myocardial cells, and it is a life-threatening event. It occurs when blood flow to a portion of cardiac muscle is completely blocked, which results in prolonged tissue ischemia and irreversible cell damage. Now, acute MIs can be classified as subendocardial, also called non-Q wave infarctions, or as transmural or also called Q wave infarctions. When all layers of the myocardium are affected, it is known as a transmural infarction. Acute MIs can also be described by the area of the heart that is damaged. For example, occlusion of the left anterior descending artery affects blood flow to the anterior wall of the left ventricle, and that would be called an anterior MI. Manifestations of acute MIs include pain of sudden onset that is not linked to activity and is described as crushing, severe, squeezing, tightness, or burning. Pain often begins in the center of the chest and it may radiate to other areas such as the shoulders, the neck, jaw, or arms. Um, women and older adults often experience different symptoms than these that are described here. Here in this picture, we see a transmural myocardial infarction. As you can see that the necrotic tissue involves the whole thickness of the ventricular wall. In this case, it's the left ventricle. The left ventricle is um, where most or a large number at least of infarcts occur. Now a subendocardial MI would not go through the entire thickness of the ventricle wall.
cardiac cells cannot continue with the lack of oxygen. They cannot withstand ischemia for very long before the cell dies. The problem with that is that cellular death means that area of the muscle no longer can contract. It loses function. So in the area of the infarction, where the necrosis has occurred, that will be replaced by scar tissue, which does not have the ability to contract. So then we end up with oftentimes left ventricular dysfunction if the MI has occurred in the left ventricle. Now, how much dysfunction or the degree of function is going to depend on the size of the area that was involved in the myocardial infarction. Another term you should be familiar with is that of hypokinesia. Hypokinesia refers to decreased heart wall motion, and this is what we find after a patient has had an MI, because in that area affected by the infarction, it no longer contracts and it's visible, um, especially through EKGs, they can determine that the heart wall is no longer contracting as it did before. Sometimes you'll also see that the findings of an echocardiogram indicate that there is global hypokinesia. And that would mean that the entire heart muscle itself is weakened, okay? It is not contracting um, strong with strong contractions at all. On EKG, um, the QRS complex that you see here and highlighted in green represents ventricular contraction. Okay, the Q wave that you see in a normal heartbeat is the first downward deflection um, of the QRS complex. You see, it's typically very small. Oh, oftentimes, we don't even see the downward deflection at all. So oftentimes, the Q wave is absent or very small in a normal heartbeat. However, when there is death of an area of the heart muscle, it can produce a Q wave on the EKG tracing. When a patient has had a myocardial infarction, um, you can think of it as if there, that scar tissue creates an electrical hole. It's electrically dead. And that is what results in that pathologic Q wave on the EKG tracing after an acute MI. Okay, the Q wave will be developing shortly after and, and it will be um, still there uh, later after long after the individual has had a heart attack. So a pathological or pathologic Q wave is deep and wide, nothing like you see on the normal heartbeat. So if it's deep or wide, it is a pathologic Q wave, and it is an indication of a previous or past myocardial infarction. We see here an acute MI on the EKG tracing. There is again a wide and deep, or I say pronounced or significant Q wave visible when a patient is having an MI, okay? In this picture here, we see an acute MI, it's in progress. Okay, this is not after, it is occurring right now. And we see a Q wave associated with that. It is necrosis or death of an area of the heart muscle that produces the Q wave on the EKG. 
Seeing the Q wave here, along with the ST segment elevation, makes the diagnosis of infarction. Okay, so in this picture, an MI is in progress. And we see both the development of the Q wave along with the ST segment elevation, creating this image of a fireman's hat. So it doesn't take um, a very expert eye to recognize when somebody is in the process of having an acute MI. They can simply recognize the fireman's hat, and then you will know that they are having an MI, and we can make that diagnosis of an infarction. So how do we treat an MI? But see, the nursing diagnosis for an MI is ineffective perfusion. Ineffective perfusion is a nursing diagnosis which requires you to specify which area of the body you are talking about. In this case, you would be correct in saying myocardial because it is the heart muscle that is not being perfused effectively. Okay. So what do we do? A very direct intervention. If something is not being perfused or provided with adequate oxygenation, then we should intervene and administer supplemental oxygen therapy to this patient. So that would be an um, important intervention when somebody is having the issue of ineffective perfusion and especially would be an important intervention with an acute MI. In this picture too, we see the fireman's hat. So we know that there is an acute myocardial infarction occurring. Injury is occurring as we speak, as we witness this EKG tracing. EKG changes that are characteristics, characteristic of myocardial infarction are shown in these pictures. We see the characteristic ST segment elevation. And we also can see the clinically significant development of a Q wave. And that is very characteristic of a transmural infarction. So it looks like we have an ST elevation MI, and it's likely to be a transmural um, infarction as we see the very deep and pronounced Q wave developing. The body's response to the necrosis or cellular death is inflammation, and that begins the process of healing. It starts with the uh, white blood cells and enzymes coming to the area. We also see um, the replacement of collagen in that area where the myocardial tissue used to be and the development then of scar tissue. Okay. And this is an inflammatory process, so we also see the development of a fever in these patients after a heart attack. You can see on this picture, the whiteness there represents the scar tissue that's forming. And the problem with that is that scar tissue is fibrous, it doesn't stretch, and it certainly doesn't um, lead to a contraction, um, contribute to the contraction. And so then we have a decrease in cardiac output. The scar tissue is never as strong as the original tissue, no matter where it is in your body. Scar tissue is weak, and it's going to be important after the heart attack that the patient regains their um, previous activity level. So we're going to um, slowly schedule them to build up uh, and to tolerate, improve their activity levels. Um, as we said, the scar tissue is less compliant. It's not stretchy. It doesn't help contract. And this, if that scar tissue is a large area, 
It can result in ventricular dysfunction and possibly even heart pump failure. And that most certainly would lead to death. Okay. Now the patient is usually going to be transferred to a step down unit on the third day after a myocardial infarction. They're going to be there um, transferred out of the cardiac care unit so that they can start to improve their activity tolerance. They're going to go for supervised walks for gradually increasing the distances. They're going to be encouraged to walk further and further as they um, improve their tolerance. So what are the signs and symptoms of myocardial infarction? Of course, they do include pain of sudden onset that's not linked to activity. Um, in addition to that feeling described as a crushing, severe tightness, squeezing, or burning, um, other frequent manifestations include things like anxiety, fear, tachycardia or bradycardia, cool, clammy, sometimes even mottled skin, indicating that there's very poor perfusion, and um, also blood pressure changes. Also, we can see uh, manifestations such as nausea and vomiting. Now, some people may experience experience little or mild pain because they have collateral circulation. These generally are our older adults. But as we said, nausea and vomiting can be a sign as well, and it's quite common because there is a vasovagal response also associated with MIs. Um, as we already mentioned earlier, especially during the re healing process and inflammation fever goes along with that so it, this patient can have a fever within those first 24 hours um, after a heart attack other cardiovascular manifestations of acute mi include blood pressure and heart rate changes. Initially, the blood pressure and heart rate are increased, but as the heart becomes damaged and there is destruction and necrosis of the tissue, we can actually see a decrease in cardiac output, and this causes the blood pressure to drop as well. We can also see with this failing heart that fluid or blood backs up into the pulmonary vascular system, increasing pressures there and pushing fluid into the lungs. So upon auscultation, you can hear crackles and it certainly is something that the nurse should be assessing for when a patient is having a heart attack because that would indicate that it's uh, progressing um, and becoming more severe because the area of the MI is becoming so large that it's having an effect on the heart's ability to pump the blood forward. And that's what the crackles indicate. Now, in addition, depending on the area of the heart that's affected, we can also see um, swelling and edema. Sometimes it's peripheral edema, it could be liver, enlargement or engorgement. Also, we can see um, JVD and pulmonary congestion as well. The immediate treatment for an acute MI includes these four, um, I guess we could call them all drugs. These four drugs we need in the treatment of an acute MI. Uh, we use the acronym MONA, to indicate these four drugs, but it does not indicate the order at all. The M in MONA stands for morphine. The O stands for oxygen. The N stands for nitroglycerin. And the A stands for aspirin. 
although we could use another antiplatelet medication such as Plavix. Now, women experience um, acute MIs very differently, and we discussed the historical reason for that. Uh, women were not selected as participants in our cardiac studies long ago um, because women would oftentimes get pregnant and drop out of the study. So to make a successful study, they selected all men and they found the signs and symptoms of heart attack. As it turned out that the signs and symptoms that we've been learning about the elephant standing on the chest or that um, sudden chest pain, that really strong pressure, squeezing feeling, those are not the symptoms that women experience. Yes, men present that way, but women present differently. Women experience prodromal symptoms, sometimes up to a month before the MI. And those symptoms can come and go, okay? So some of these symptoms include things that are very vague, such as fatigue. Oh, I'm more tired than I usually am. I'm not sleeping well, okay? I feel, I've been feeling anxious lately. They may have shortness of breath, they may have indigestion or heartburn. These are symptoms that really, typically before we realized it, um, would not point toward the heart as being the culprit of their symptoms. It was less frequently that women reported chest discomfort or chest pain. So many women were dismissed and never diagnosed with um, cardiac heart disease when they had these symptoms. Certainly all of these symptoms disappear after a woman experiences an acute MI. Now this slide shows you just how frequently women experience acute MIs. As it turns out, these alarming statistics show that one in four women dies from heart disease. It's the number one killer of women, regardless of race or ethnicity. It also strikes at younger ages than most people think, and the risk rises in women in middle age. As it turns out, two thirds of women who have heart attacks never fully recover. So it's quite interesting that women, as well as older adults, experience the symptoms of heart attack as listed here with indigestion, heartburn, nausea, and vomiting. And yet we still have a lot of, I mean, the number of deaths related to heart disease is um, way exceeds the deaths caused by other um, conditions and diseases such as breast cancer we see on this slide it is the least number of deaths is breast cancer then our lung disease COPD then lung cancer and then stroke and then you look at the red dress and that red dress campaign is an awareness campaign because people need to be aware that women do die of heart disease they do have heart attacks. In fact, one in four is going to die of heart disease. In the literature, you'll see oftentimes that MIs are referred to as acute coronary syndrome. So I just want to briefly touch on that. Um, as we said earlier, that myocardial infarctions may be classified as a STEMI or a non-STEMI. STEMI stands for ST elevation MI, myocardial infarction, and non-STEMI refers to a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. They are both myocardial infarctions, but they are classified differently. The big difference here is um, physiologically 
uh, we have a partial occlusion of a coronary artery with an end STEMI, a non STEMI. And we have a complete occlusion of the coronary artery with the STEMI. And often, no, I don't want to say often, but sometimes the non STEMI does progress to a STEMI. Okay, and that can also occur. In this slide, we see at, on the top stable angina. This is your classic chronic angina. It is not considered part of acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome refers to unstable angina and non STEMI and STEMI MIs. Okay, all of those together, whether it's a partial or complete occlusion, is included in that definition of acute coronary syndromes. I wanted to also in include this slide about acute coronary syndrome because I think it, it might help clarify for some of you who were asking in class about the cardiac biomarkers. Now, when somebody has chest pain, okay, that's your acute coronary syndrome. We're starting at the top. They have chest pain. We bring them in to perform an EKG on them. We're looking at that ST segment. Is it elevated or not? Let's go with, it is elevated. So when we see an ST elevation, we say that the individual is having a STEMI, ST elevation MI. If there is no ST elevation, we are going to do cardiac biomarkers. That means we're going to draw their blood and we're going to look most classically for troponin levels to see if the troponin level is elevated or not. If it is elevated, then they have a non-STEMI MI. If the biomarkers are negative, are not elevated, it is unstable angina. Now you might be asking, what about the STEMI? When a patient has an ST elevation MI, do they get a rise in their troponin levels? And the answer is yes. But it is used here diagnostically in this um, algorithm to show you how it can be used to determine if this is unstable angina or if it is an actual myocardial infarction. Okay, so that ST elevation MI is due to an occlusion of a coronary artery and obviously the disruption of blood flow to the myocardium, which leads to cellular necrosis. If this occurs, the patient may be a candidate for reperfusion therapy. Okay, so what we see in this picture is the cath procedure the heart catheterization, where the catheter is inserted into the groin and advanced all the way up to the coronary artery to help to unblock it and restore perfusion to the area of the myocardial tissue that is distal to the occlusion. And that procedure um, will preserve myocardial tissue. Remember, we must intervene quickly to save myocardial tissue. Once it dies, once necrosis occurs, it will become scar tissue. It will never regenerate or become myocardial tissue. So time is of utmost importance to saving the life of this individual. Okay, so what is reperfusion therapy? It is coronary angioplasty, but it's frequently called in the hospital percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCIs. So when you see the PCI 
initials, you understand that it stands for percutaneous because they're going in through the groin area, through the skin, and they're intervening up in the coronary arteries. And it involves the angioplasty, which is blowing up the balloon, as we talked about before. Uh, the balloon would be inflated across the area that is occluded. And then the balloon is inflated to smack the plaque or whatever's causing the occlusion against the walls of the vessels. And then a stent is deployed. And the stent is a scaffolding device made out of metal. And it is left in place to keep the opening and the, um, allow perfusion to occur. Again, the balloon is not left there inflated. The stent is left, but the balloon is deflated and it is withdrawn um, along with the catheter and guide wires. Okay, just leaving just the stent behind to keep the vessel open. Now the stents these days are drug eluding stents. That means that they have been coated with a drug that suppresses restenosis or the reclotting of or closing up of that lumen. The reblocking or closing up of an artery after angioplasty is called restenosis. And it's due to that excess tissue growth that can be inside or at the edge of the stent. Now, after stenting, um, a drug eluding stent, this patient will go to the CCU to be monitored very closely. And then that is where they will be given additional medications. Um, in addition, they're going to be given aspirin and a second antiplatelet drug such as Plavix. Although there are other options as well, but they must be given a second anti-clotting medication. It could be something like Effient, Berlenta, or Ticlid. Those are some other examples of drugs that are antiplatelet or anti-clotting. So you will see this, um, these abbreviations as well, or acronym DAPT. And when you see that, it refers to dual antiplatelet therapy. So the patient after having a stent placement must continue to take two medications, aspirin and Plavix generally, for a year or more sometimes after the stenting to prevent the blood from reacting to the new device by thickening and clotting, which would clog or block the new arter, uh, ex newly expanded artery. So we don't want thrombosis to occur. And so this is a good place for me to mention the fact that anytime we introduce instrumentation or a device into the body, the body's response is to form a clot around it. So we say that those devices and instrumentation are thrombogenic. They cause clots to form. And that, again, is what will happen when you place a stent in the body. A clot will want to form there. So these patients must take these two medications for approximately a year to make sure that it does not reocclude. We also said that heart attacks could be classified by the area of the heart that's involved. And so sometimes we will describe a heart attack such by using words such as this, anterior, inferior, lateral, posterior, or a combination of two. Um, we may say it's a posterior uh, lateral. That would, we may see it's an inferior anterior together. So it can be a combination, but we use those terms to describe the area involved the area where we have the necrotic tissue.
or scar tissue forming. Again, the severity of anybody's uh, MI is going to depend on how much collateral circulation they have. So uh, it's a good idea to incorporate exercise into our daily routine to promote the growth of collateral circulation. This will improve our perfusion to our heart, even if um, we would develop at some point a uh, occlusion in a coronary artery. It will lessen the degree or severity of an MI. Now this I'm going to tell you, um, not because I want you to memorize the leads that are involved in these different locations, um, but because you'll have a little bit of an understanding of it. Some of you will go on to work in critical care areas, maybe the CCU, maybe the cardiovascular ICU. And in those cases, you will be expected to learn and memorize these leads, which are um, indicate what area of the heart has had the damage to the tissue. Okay, so um, now leads are simply, now we have these 12 leads that so they're showing us here. Basically, we have 12 leads and leads are simply a way of looking at the heart muscle understand that we can get different views of what's going on in the heart by looking from different angles or using different leads, so to speak. For example, if I want to see the posterior aspect of the heart, I'm not going to look at leads that will only show me the anterior surface of the heart. So you're going to select the leads that are going to allow you to view the electrical activity in the area of the heart where the damage has occurred. Because as a critical care nurse looking at the caring for this patient, we don't need to bother ourselves with monitoring the leads where the infarct did not occur. No, we're going to select the leads that are going to allow us to view the area of the heart where the damage has occurred. And so I'll just show you this. Um, let's look at the inferior infarction. We see that nicely diagrammed on the right side of the slide. Um, when we have a patient who's had an inferior infarct, we should look at leads 2, 3, and AVF. These are the three leads that are going to allow us to look at the electrical activity in that area of the heart. And we will also look at the Q wave. The Q wave is a real good indication of um, the location, because if the Q wave is prominent in 2, 3, and AVF in those three leads, then it indicates that the patient has had an inferior infarction. So for those of you who plan to go into cardiac critical care units. Um, you could memorize these. They're up here for you if you so choose, um, but you don't have to for this course, which is a, a, a basic introduction, fundamental course to cardiac care. Um, but we'll look at the anterior wall. If you wanted to look at the anterior wall, um, you could look at leads V1 through 4 or more specifically, v, uh, leads V3 and V4. So um, that would give you an idea of which leads would be best to monitor in your patient, depending on where their um, heart attack occurred. Now we're moving on and talking about complications of heart attacks. Okay. And in fact, this patient is in the ICU, and really I see the role of the ICU nurse or a critical care nurse is being there to watch for complications that can arise with the patient. Okay. More than anything else, I think that we are being paid on an hourly basis to monitor that patient very closely hourly. 
and looking for trends and things that indicate complications. Well, we can't look for complications if we don't know what we're looking for. So now we're going to study some of the most common complications of patients who've had a myocardial infarction. 80% of complications are dysrhythmias. Okay, so dysrhythmias are going to um, be changes in the conduction system of the heart. I'm not talking about the coronary arteries anymore. I'm not talking about the circulatory system, but the conduction system within the heart is now affected because of the myocardial infarction. Dysrhythmia is developed as a direct result of the ischemia from the heart attack, as well as electrolyte imbalances and sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Some of these dysrhythmias can be life-threatening, especially if the heart attack occurred in the anterior wall, or if we have heart pump failure, and even, as we mentioned here, this shock state would be cardiogenic shock, which would mean complete heart pump failure. Um, the types of dysrhythmias that can occur can include heart blocks, okay? So a third degree or complete heart block could also occur as a result. It's one of the dysrhythmias that could occur as a result of an MI. So we will learn more about these things, but you, in terms of interpreting arrhythmias and dysrhythmias, but understand that it is the most common complication, you need to know that, of, my, of acute MIs. Now let's practice some NCLEX style questions. The nurse is evaluating the 12 lead EKG of a client experiencing an inferior wall myocardial infarction. While conferring with the team, she correctly identifies which of the following EKG changes associated with an evolving MI. And there are three correct answers. You can have your T wave inversion, ST segment elevation, and pathologic Q wave. Oh, I guess we only had one question. So we're going to now talk about some dysrhythmias because dysrhythmias are the most common complication of acute MIs, we're going to talk about some in particular. And these are the ones that can be lethal to the patient. So the first of these that we'll talk about is ventricular fibrillation. V-fib can be lethal and usually occurs within four hours after the onset of pain, which is your acute MI. Okay. Sometimes it is preceded by PVCs, which are premature ventricular contractions, which we'll talk about in more detail later. But know that these premature ventricular contractions are an indication that the heart is very irritable. It's usually irritable because it's ischemic. Um, V-fib means that the ventricles, the workhorses of the heart, are quivering. Imagine that. The ventricles are supposed to be delivering a nice synchronous contraction so that it can move the blood forward. But because of this dysrhythmia, the ventricles are no longer beating like that. Instead, they are just quivering what do you think is going to happen to the cardiac output in this case? 
Yes, it's going to be terribly decreased. Okay, so we need to intervene and immediately treat this patient. We're going to treat them when we see the PVCs, because if we see the premature ventricular contractions indicating that the patient could develop V-fib, we want to treat them before they develop the lethal arrhythmia. PVCs are not lethal, but they lead to a lethal arrhythmia. So we want to soothe this very irritable heart so that it doesn't lead to V-fib. And we do that by administering a medication called lidocaine. Lidocaine soothes the irritable heart. That's what I like to think of because I see PVCs as indication that the heart is irritable and I want to soothe the irritable heart, get rid of the PVCs with the lidocaine before it ever develops into a ventricular fibrillation. And so what we do is give a bolus of lidocaine um, and then we follow that up with a continuous infusion or a lidocaine drip. Okay. It's not important that you memorize the dosage, but I just wanted to show you that here's an example of a case where you would have to administer the dosage based on the patient's weight. Okay. Um, so you have to be able to do your calculations, your drug doses calculations, um, in order to correctly administer this medication. Okay. So I want to show you what a premature ventricular contraction looks like at this time. It's a little hard to do. Um, without uh, being able to use the pointer. Let me see something. I think I do have the ability with this instrument here. Oh, a laser pointer. Let me try that. Yes, I'm so excited. So I do have a way of showing you. Okay, so let's follow this. We have a P wave, P, this first downward deflection. This little one is the Q, R, S, T. Okay. That's one heartbeat. And then we have the next heartbeat, P. You might want to label this on your drawing. P, Q, R, S, T. Well, now I'll just tell you real quickly. The P is the atria contracting. The QRS represent the ventricle, ventricles contracting. And the T represents relaxation of the ventricles. So we have PQRST, PQRST, and the next thing that should follow is a P wave, but it's not a P wave. Instead, we have this premature contraction. Something came before it was supposed to, and it always looks like this. And I'm not going to try to figure out what it all stands for. All you have to do is be able to visually recognize this wide and bizarre tracing. Okay. In fact, this PVC, premature ventricular contraction, came before it was supposed to. Okay. And so it's premature. It's always wide and bizarre. That's how we describe it. Eventually, the heartbeat gets back to normal. We have a P, Q, R, S, T, uh-oh, again. Oh my, we have another premature ventricular contraction. Okay. Remember I told you that every cardiac cell is capable of initiating a contraction. And obviously, they did not wait on the pacemaker, okay? The pacemaker initiated this impulse and this contraction, but not this one. Yes, with this one and not with this one. Some other ectopic area 
initiated these two contractions that we see here. Then it, we have another compensatory pause to get us back on track. And then we have a P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. Uh-oh, something came before the P again, and it's the ventricular contraction. All right, so as you can see in this strip, we have one, two, three premature ventricular contractions. And in fact, the shapes are identical. The form of these premature ventricular contractions are the same. We call them uniform. In other words, the same cells that initiated this contraction came from the same area of the heart. Okay, so we have one, two, three premature ventricular contractions. And if I would ask you to circle them, you would make an oval shape like this. It includes all of this. All right. So this tells me when we see frequent PVCs that the heart is irritable. If I let this continue, the patient is likely to develop a life-threatening dysrhythmia. So I want to intervene now. I want to administer the bolus of lidocaine now to prevent it from going further. We want to soothe the irritable heart. Now here again, we see PVCs. Here's a normal heartbeat, P, Q, R, S, T. Oh boy, this is not a P wave. This whole thing is a PVC. P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. But then I'm expecting it to be a P from the pacemaker to make a P wave, and it doesn't. Instead, we have another wide and bizarre complex that we call a PVC. And the same thing again, P, Q, R, S, T. And now we have a wide and bizarre PVC. So again, we have three PVCs in, uh, in a, a matter of seconds, for sure. So we have three PVCs, but do they look the same? Are their forms identical? Well, these two are but this one isn't, okay? So we call them, they, we say they have different forms and we would call them multi-form PVCs. And that indicates that the area that initiated these two is a different area of the heart than that which initiated this one. And this would mean that actually the heart is more irritable when we see a multi-form PVCs on the strip compared to a, um, a ones that are all the same form. So now that was our introduction to V-fib and we're moving on to another dysrhythmia that can occur after a heart attack. And this one is called ventricular tachycardia, okay? This looks very different than ventricular fibrillation. And it's very easy to recognize. Look, it looks like tombstones. Um, some people say mountains, other people say tombstones because it helps them to remember that ventricular tachycardia is a lethal dysrhythmia. Okay. What's happening here? The ventricles are not fibrillating. Okay, that was V-fib. This time the ventricles are beating so rapidly. And you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see how rapid it can become. It can be, go up to 250 beats per minute. And as we said earlier, the problem with that very fast ventricular rate 
is that there is no time for the ventricles to fill properly. And so what happens consequently to the cardiac output? Yes, it's decreased, it's severely decreased. So VTAC is another lethal arrhythmia um, that can result as a complication of acute MIs. Okay, very easy to recognize. Look at VFib that we talked about first. Okay. VFib we said is also a lethal arrhythmia. It looks very different than the mountains of VTAC. This might be considered little hills or molehills. Okay. Not the big mountains, but the little mole hills as the ventricles are fibrillating and quivering. Okay. Um, it's very chaotic activity, and again, it severely impacts cardiac output. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to say, but I guess I, I'm not sure if I mention it here or later. But let me see how that works out. How do we treat this? Okay, and it's really easy to remember treatment for VFib because it rhymes. And we always like things that help us to learn and memorize. So the treatment for VFib is DFib. DFib stands for defibrillation. And that would be shock. You need to deliver shock to this individual um, to stop this dysrhythmia and hope that it starts back up in a rhythm that we can do something about, such as uh, sinus brady, tachycardia, normal sinus rhythm, anything else, but not this lethal arrhythmia. Okay, this is really bad. So why we have the verbal and visual check up here is because when we defibrillate or shock an individual who has, def who has VFib, we have to make sure that nobody is touching the patient, okay? Nobody is touching the bed rail or else that person will be shocked as well. And shocks stop the heart from beating. So we do that visual check, make, put our eyes on everybody to make sure nobody is touching the patient or bed or stretcher. And we do a verbal check as well. We say, all clear? And everybody responds clear okay so nobody is touching and we can now proceed with the shock to stop this patient's heart okay all right so this presentation is now going to talk about another complication of acute MIs and that is congestive heart failure. And heart failure occurs when the pumping power of the heart is decreased. And you can just imagine that, can't you? If you have a large area of the heart that is now dead, no longer conducts electricity, no longer contributes to contraction, um, how that's going to impact the heart pumping power of the heart. Okay. And this occurs within 24 hours after a heart attack. So this is heart failure. Um, I would really say it's an acute heart failure, not a chronic heart failure. So don't get that um, confused because of the C there. Chronic heart failure is something that develops over time. But this type of heart failure, congestive heart failure, is acute. It occurs quickly, within 24 hours after having a heart attack. So we need to know now, as the nurse caring for this patient who's had a heart attack, what are the signs and symptoms of heart failure? Because I need to be uh, alerted if they are developing heart failure. Okay, the symptoms are very subtle. It takes a good nurse to pick up on these things. Because in the beginning, they start with slight dyspnea, okay? Remember, it's very hard 
to see these slight changes in breathing unless you're really, really looking closely. Another thing when people aren't breathing well, because in this case, they're having fluid build up in their lungs, they become restless. That's that first change in level of consciousness, restlessness. It's very subtle as well. And then they might progress to being agitated. And then you'll see in their vital signs an increase in their heart rate. Because when they're not breathing well, the heart starts to beat faster to get more blood circulating uh, and oxygen to the tissues. We can also hear the development of crackles or adventitious breath sounds in the lungs as fluid is filling in the lungs. So we are most carefully monitoring the basis of their lungs for the presence or development of crackles, which would indicate that they are developing heart failure. Okay. And there are less common complications of myocardial infarction listed on this page here. So I just want you to know that there are many complications, um, including cardiogenic shock, which is heart pump failure, um, ventricular aneurysm, which is an outpouching of the ventricular wall. Okay, when the ventricular wall becomes very thin, as this aneurysm here, um, the blood doesn't move well in this chamber and the blood actually becomes stagnant and can cause a thrombus or blood clot to form in the left ventricle. So that's another complication of MIs and others are include pericarditis and pulmonary embolism. But I want you to remember the most common that would really make me happy, the ones that we went into quite a bit of detail with, the dysrhythmias and the heart failure. Now quickly I'll talk a little bit about surgeries. Sometimes um, there is multiple vessel disease. In other words, more than a single coronary artery has an occlusion. Um, maybe there are occlusions throughout several different coronary vessels. Okay, in that case, doing a stenting procedure is not going to be adequate. Okay, and they would have to um, schedule a surgery for this patient. This would be open heart surgery called a cabbage, which stands for coronary artery bypass graft. They will take the grafting material from the individual. Typically, it comes from the saphenous vein in the leg and these patients can come back with a long scar along the inside of one of their legs and they'll use a portion of the saphenous vein to bypass the obstructions in the uh, native coronary artery um, sometimes the grafting material will come from the internal mammary artery and it, and then of course they wouldn't have that scar down the length of their leg, but instead um, this would be taken from generally the left internal mammary artery. They will take a part of that and use it as the bypass graft. In that case, you'll see it mentioned in the chart as a LEMA. And when you see the word or acronym LEMA, it stands for left internal mammary artery was used in this surgery. With coronary artery bypass graft surgery, the heart must be stopped. And for that reason, the patient will be put on a heart lung machine or cardiopulmonary bypass machine. All the blood will circulate outside the body and through the machine and will be oxygenated and returned to the body. Okay, during the procedure or surgery.